Well, there's a lot of stories I'd rather tell um, than this one, but it, this seems like the only one that really matters. Uh, our son, Cody Roman Dial, he disappeared uh, in Costa Rica in 2014. And Cody Roman, he was conceived in a tent in the Brooks Range, and he was born in February in Fairbanks. And when he was six years old, he and I walked across Umnak, which is uh, a remote Aleutian Island, just the two of us, 60 miles in a week. And after that, he always introduced himself as Roman. So uh, in elementary school, Roman, his sister Jazz, and his mom Peggy and I, we traveled all over the world visiting rainforests and coral reefs and deserts. And when he was in high school, he helped me with some of my research projects. Jazzy and Roman skied around the Harding Ice Field with me for a week, counting ice worms. He took two months off of school and went to Borneo and helped me in the rainforest canopy. Um, in high school and college, we did pack rafting all over the state. Uh, we pack rafted in Malaysia, Australia. We even did the Grand Canyon together. And in fact, the, the last time that I saw him, uh, we met down in, in Mexico with a bunch of friends and pack rafted these waterfalls down there. And he was starting this seven month trip through Latin America. So on his trip, he would um, you know, email us and he'd tell us about you know, watching monarch butterflies in the Sierra Madre or sea turtles on the Pacific swimming with whale sharks in the Caribbean. And he got down to Guatemala and he wrote me this email and he said, um, Dad, I'm going to do this 200 kilometer, 10 day solo walk along the border of Mexico and Guatemala to visit these Mayan ruins. And I, I wrote him back. I wrote him this email and I said, no, <laughs> don't do that, Roman. That sounds too dangerous. But I didn't send that email. I deleted it. And I wrote him. I said, um, I said, well, you know, be careful with the machete and watch out for snakes. So he did that trip and he wrote another email about it. It was like 6,000 words long. It was an amazing story. And I, I, I liked it so much, I sent it to all of my friends who'd seen Roman grow up. And, uh, and it kind of set the pattern for what he would do for the rest of his trip. He would write us an email and say, here's what I'm going to do. And he'd say, I got back and I'll write you more tomorrow. And then he'd write this really great story about his adventures. After about seven months, he wrote me from Costa Rica and asked about maps. He wanted to know if I knew where he could get some topo maps. And, um, and I said, yeah, maybe, yeah, here, try this. And then I took off on my own trip to the Talkeetnas to go pack rafting. And then I came back and we went dip netting on the Kenai. And, you know, I checked my phone and I didn't see anything. You know, just that thread about the maps. And Peggy and I were coming back from the Kenai and we stopped to do some grocery shopping. And... And, and we were talking about, why haven't we heard from Roman? And she's like, God, you know, I, I feel really nauseous. So we went home, and I dove into these emails that had been collecting, and I went to that thread, buried in that thread about topo maps, was this email from Roman, and he said, hey, I'm going into Corcovado National Park, which is the biggest wilderness area in Costa Rica. I'm going into Corcovado by myself for five days, and I'm going to bushwhack because um, I don't want to hire a guide. I don't have enough money to hire a guide. And the last words on the email were like, you know, there'll be a trail to the west of me and, and coastline on the other sides, and it should be difficult to get lost forever. And the email was two weeks, two weeks old, and he was 10 days overdue. And uh, I immediately called the American Embassy in Costa Rica, and I emailed Corcovado National Park, and I asked my friend Ty Verzoni to drop everything, to, you know, drop his job, drop his wife, and, you know, leave his two-month-old baby and come with me to Costa Rica to look for my son. So we flew down there, and, you know, I thought we'd just be there for 10 days, and I ended up staying 40 days. And when we got there, the... Uh, the very first night, Ty and I walked through the town and I found the hostel where Roman had stayed and there he had his yellow bag was there that he'd left behind, the things he didn't need for the jungle. And uh, a few days later, um, Ty found uh, some miners 
who had encountered Roman on this illegal mining trail in the jungle, cooking breakfast on this like jet boil stove. And uh, the authorities there in Costa Rica, they wouldn't let me go into the jungle. But, you know, I snuck in, I went anyway. And, uh, and it was really hot and humid, and it rained, and it, was, it, it felt dangerous. Uh, one time, Ty stepped over a log on the trail, it was about this high, and coiled up on the log was this green viper. And Ty had stepped, like, right over it and didn't see it. And Ty went back to his family and um, some other friends, Brad Micklejohn and Todd Tumalo, they came down to help me. And there were, like, you know, the, the, more snakes, you know. Todd pretty much just about walked into a viper hanging in a bush. And we, other friends came down, they didn't really know <laughs> what they were getting into. And we would rappel down into these green slot canyons that would flash flood because I thought maybe Roman had slipped into one of these inaccessible places. One night there was a horrible rainstorm and this tree came down. It was like a 150 foot tree and it landed just a few yards away from the, one of our tents with three people inside. And it just, it felt really dangerous. And I, I realized this is why the authorities didn't want me in the jungle and I didn't want my friends in the jungle. It was just too much. But the landscape, when you look at the mountains, they look really smooth, but you get up in them and they're just all folded up in a maze of steep ridges and these narrow canyons. And I would walk up the ridges and down the creeks yelling, Roman! You know, but we didn't find anything. <laughs> Nothing. Peggy came down and we walked the exact route that Roman had described in an email, like over the peninsula, all off trail and all illegal, and we're sneaking back along the beach in the dark. And Peggy says, he's not in the jungle. Somebody took him. There'd been like this persistent story that Roman had gotten together for three days and walked across the peninsula with this, this guy who was a... Uh, a drug dealer and a thief. And it just didn't add up. Like Roman had written me, he didn't want to go with any guides. And he was doing his own thing. And I'd already met these miners who, you know, said, hey, I saw Roman over here and I couldn't figure out why would Roman be over there. And I, uh, at this point, I had to get an American investigator involved. I needed somebody who could speak Spanish and push buttons and uh, find answers. So I, I picked this retired um, DEA agent. He'd worked in Latin America for 25 years, and his name is Carson, and he's like 10 feet tall and super muscular and bald, and, and he's got tattoos, and he's just scary to talk to. And, and he was the kind of guy that could sniff out criminals and, and get them to talk. So I spent seven weeks with Carson last year, seven weeks down there sitting down with these suspects, these people who probably, probably killed our son, had a beer with them, offered them reward money, pretended like I didn't know they were involved to try to get them to help find our son's body because without the body in Costa Rica, there's really no, no case. I did find one piece of evidence in January. I was there with uh, Costa Rican investigators and some cadaver dogs deep in the jungle and I had gotten in the habit of looking underneath of um, underneath of miners tarps and, and in their tents and things to see if I could find anything of Romans and there was a foam pad a little piece of a foam pad that I'd given him when we'd been pack rafting in Mexico and I was like holy cow there's that's the first thing I found and it turns out that the miner who was mining right next to this tarp he had lived with the mother of our primary suspect. But that's the only piece of evidence that we've had. It took a whole year to get this case elevated from a missing persons to a homicide. It could be another year before they arrest anybody as a suspect, but I, I don't know, it may be, it may be never. And I'm, I'm tired, really. I'm exhausted going down there. I've spent, you know, six months of the last year and a half searching. And, uh, and the bummer is that I don't want to go down anymore. But if I don't go down, if I'm not present, 
then nothing really happens. So that's all I got to say.